So for this panel, it's going to be on the topic of data protection. Um, we have four, we have three people plus uh, Tom moderating. So I'll introduce them now. Um, we've got Tom Bregelman. He's the moderator. He uh, was the general counsel at Leverton. He's now an attorney at BBL. He's an advocate for the legal community understanding new technology. <laughs> We also have Sylvan Youngers. I hope I said your name right. I, was it close enough? Oh my goodness. I have an American accent, so not so good. OK. Founder of Tech. <laughs> he is the founder of Tech GDPR. And he's a consultant in the blockchain space, representing DLT labs in Europe, privacy and data protection enthusiast, and will be helping tech companies become GDPR compliant with new initiatives. Um, and we also have. Florian Glatz, he's a blockchain lawyer, lawyer and consultant bridging the gap between laws and software code. Projects he's advising right now are Raiden, Trubit, Singular DTV, and others. He's president of the German Blockchain Association, the Bundesblock, and co-founder of Legal Tech Center, Berlin Legal Tech, Swiss Legal Tech, and Paris Legal Tech, Hathakathon, and Conference. And we also have Jan Christian Saul, he's a digital policy expert. He is a lecturer for constitutional law at Humboldt University an associate researcher at Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and until last week, a lawyer at BDI, the Federal Federation of German Industries, where he was politically involved in the lawmaking process of GDPR, now founder of what We Lobby. So I just did those intros really quick. Tom, of course, will um, do more with the panel. So I will hand it over now. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, yeah. Maybe I sit at the side and then I let the panelists do all the work. No. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for introducing all the, the panelists. Um, maybe I can ask each panelist, um, each of you, in maybe in 30 seconds on a minute, can you add anything to the int introduction that Liz just gave? Anything you want to add from your personal experience just about you so that people know a little bit more? Uh, Sylvan, you want to start maybe? Sure. Hi. Um yeah, so what, what, else, what else do I do? So I basically work in blockchain as well, representing a Canadian company, Blockchain Development House, here in Europe. And, and through that, I also got into the data protection thing, basically. Thank you. I have nothing much to add. It's true that I worked at BDI until last week, so I used to work there as a lobbyist um, um, for the industry uh, side, uh, the German companies. And I was just let's say, how do, you, how do you say that? I was involved in the lawmaking process of that GDPR uh, data protection law in the last four or five years, right? And I quit that job last week and now I try to do something different. But that's not topic for today, I think. I think it's actually interesting, uh, what the new thing you do. You should tell us about it. Okay. Um, so uh, I see myself here mainly as a representative of the German uh, blockchain association that we uh, founded uh, in summer 2017, which is kind of a lobby group for blockchain technology. And part of our mission is to understand h how to bring privacy and blockchain together and how can we communicate possible solutions to politicians in order to make sure that the, the regulations to come and the implementation of the GDPR um, will not hinder the growth of blockchain. So I'm very grateful for this conference and the opportunity to be here. Also, just in order to learn what kind of possibilities we have and how to communicate that to politics so that yeah, we, we're not kind of inhibited in, in, in the growth of the potential of blockchain technology. Thank you very much, Florian. Florian. Uh, one thing about myself, I used to be general counsel at Leverton, a company that with artificial intelligence is uh, extracting data from documents. That sounds data protection and privacy relevant, doesn't it? Because the artificial intelligence was, of course, extracting a lot of personal data as well, uh, or not, depending on your views. Uh, that was interesting for me to see. Now let's go get right started. Why are we here? Why do we even need to talk about uh, data protection and privacy anymore? Is this, is this necessary? Uh, has anything changed, Sylvan? Do you want to uh, jump right in? 
Don't say because data is the new oil. <laughs> but it is, in a way. Right, so I think from, from my point of view, so it's more like the technical approach to things than, than anything else, right? Um, I see that more and more data is being collected. Uh, there's more and more data stored on your devices, like your iPhone even, even tracks like all your locations where you've been. And I don't think that everyone is really aware of it. Like, like here in this room, probably they are, but, but in, in, in general terms, the awareness of what kind of data is being stored and what is being used by, by larger corporations or by social media or whatsoever, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that, that people don't, don't grasp the whole impact of that. Perhaps not right now, perhaps not in a year, perhaps, perhaps in five years or ten years, right? But, but like if you think about what, what all this data can be used for in this period of time, I think it's time that, that, that people will become generally more aware of, of the impacts that, that this data collection has. So for, for me, I think, I think that's definitely a very good point. Yeah? Jan, Jan, you want to add on that? I can just support that from a, <clears throat> from a legal or political perspective. Because when I, uh, I used to study law in, let's say, around 2000, 2005, and I think there was not, in, 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 at the University of Bonn mainly, I think there was not one single lecture on data protection law uh, that was offered in these years. And I didn't attend any uh, of, of these. Well, th I think there really were none. And I didn't know anybody that was f following that subject. And even when I started working for, for that federation, for BDI, in 2011, um, it wasn't even, you know, I was responsible for data protection laws, but it wasn't even in the job description. Uh, and when I had my job interview, uh, there was just, let's say, half a sentence, and they told me that, okay, apart from all these things that we told you, you should also be the, the data protection officer for us, and you, should, you, ha you would have to take care about data protection uh, legal issues. Would that be okay for you? And, and uh, well, I was, I was surprised with that, and I, you know, I wasn't that fascinated with that subject. I thought it was very dry and everything, but I didn't say no, of course. Uh, and w when I left now, uh, last week, uh, it was just a total shift because in the beginning nobody wanted to do that uh, within my organization and now almost everybody wanted to, to take care of that issue because it became so sexy in a way. The lawyers also call the uh, European GDPR the Lawyerful Employment Act, by the way, <laughs> because uh, everybody wants to get a piece of that and it's sowing so much confusion, but I'm sorry for interrupting Florian, what's your take? Um, so, I, I never really cared that much about the privacy debate, I have to admit, and I don't consider myself to be a privacy expert, but um, being in the blockchain space and uh, consulting with startups and, and bigger corporations on the matter, it always, it's a topic that always creeps up. And so, I'm naturally interested in um, this interface between privacy and blockchain specifically. Privacy in the broader sense um, is, is, n is not a topic that concerns me professionally in general, but as how it relates to blockchain, it very much does. And um, I find it interesting that um, so far privacy, the privacy debate has focused on this classical notion of data protection, how to keep data secret uh, to um, uh, uh, private to the user. Um, and with blockchain, we've got this additional dimension into the debate, which I think is only starting out now, which is the monetization aspect of data. So we suddenly see companies like um, BigchainDB or Ocean Protocol, what they are calling it now, or IOTA, or uh, other platforms that use distributed ledger technology in the broader sense to monetize personal data. So that's a new facet of the debate and I, uh, it's something that I find quite fascinating. Um, and maybe a third aspect I think that blockchain also, uh, or a second aspect that blockchain brings is the concept of data sovereignty. So the idea that for the first time I can actually own my data that naturally correlates with monetizing the data obviously so I have sovereignty and through that the ability of monetization and 
this isn't really connected to privacy in the sense of keeping data secret, but rather um, making users the the owners of their data and being able to monetize it. And I find that that f aspect fascinating. Um, Silvan, uh, Jan, you want to add on that, or maybe you can have a discussion before I just move on to the next point. So, so I think further to what you said, Jan, is is also. Where, where this all started with, with uh, like a side assignment to uh, like a legal counsel job or, or like a legal job to also take care of data protection. Right now, we are, we, we are, we're going into something under the GDPR that's, that many companies are going to need like a, like a data protection officer. And this data protection officer will need to be reporting directly to the highest organ in the company. And, and I, th I, think, I think this is a very interesting shift that's happening there. Absolutely, and and, and with, with with blockchain, there's um, there are always these these two sides to things, right? So there's on, there's on one side um, the the possibility to create a much more open society or or an open world, but at the same time, you need to be very very careful with storing anything that is private, like personal data, in a in a blockchain environment, because <coughs> sorry, because the other aspect of blockchain is of course that you that you can never remove the data again. And that is, that is a big issue under the GDPR. So, right. Just one last comment, maybe be why it's becoming more and more important for companies uh, to, to, you know, to, to deal and comply with data protection laws. It's just um, it's a question of money, right? Uh, uh, right until now in Germany, I think the maximum amount of money you had to pay when you were breaking laws was 300,000 euro, I think. And under the new European data protection law now, it is up to 4%, 4% of your worldwide revenues, the worldwide turnover. So compare 300 million to, I don't know, the exact Google revenues worldwide might be $80 billion probably. So yeah, it's, it, it goes up to 3 billion euro uh, sanctions, you know, if you breach European data protection laws. Google might still shrug that off, but at maybe they feel it, I don't know. But three billion, I don't know. The yeah. German term would still maybe, maybe be Kaffeekasse, right? It's just <laughs> like, uh, come on. Yeah. But, uh, but it, 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 the sanctions are, are harder. My understanding of the GDPR is also, even if you're not breaking any laws, but if you don't have your registers of what you, all of your data protection measures are, if you don't have a register of what you're actually doing, if you cannot provide this to the authorities when they request it, even then you're getting fined, even though you're not breaching or in a, not violating anybody's uh, um, yeah. privacy. That's interesting. Uh, moving on to the, in a way, the next issue here. Now we have the GDPR coming up very soon. It's going to be in force in May 2018. In a way, it's been enacted in 2016. Everybody's preparing for that. You could say it's the most modern uh, um, data protection law worldwide for a, a major jurisdiction, uh, but maybe is it outdated? I'm asking this because how are we keeping up with this technological progress that uh, is there all the time? Blockchains are becoming, be getting, becoming more prevalent or improved. Artificial intelligence is getting better and better. For instance, under the GDPR, anything that is personal data is, is I mean, it only applies to personal data, not to anonymous data, but it says anything that it has been anonymized but can be de-anonymized uh, is personal data again. For a long time you would say, I've anonymized my data, I'm not handling personal data here, I'm not subject to this law, but with new technology like artificial intelligence or other things, suddenly you might be handling personal data under the law even though you thought you would not be doing it. Uh, another example, uh, I have some friends in the Ethereum community and we sometimes talk about data protection and I sometimes just mention. What community? Ethereum ah, okay. uh, community. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about data protection, uh, I sometimes hear this argument, oh, these laws, they're so outdated. And I'm telling them, no, they're just uh, being, uh, get entering into force in, th in five months. This is not, uh, I mean, historically not outdated. It's new law being made. But maybe these laws are, from their structure, outdated because they're dealing with the past world, with the server-client model. Can anybody of you have a take on this? Is technology, in a way, outpacing us? First thought, I think it really depends on what you, what, what you consider to be a modern approach to data usage. Um, if you see data as an asset and as a value, then the, 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 the GDPR is, well, it, it's, it's strict, you know, it puts restrictions. It makes it difficult for companies to, to use and monetize data. 
if you think that this is uh, this is the wrong way, then it is an outdated law because it really it, it's, it has the same structures than we have in Europe uh, in the last 30 years when it comes to data protection. When you think it is a modern approach to 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 protect personal data in these times, uh, well, then it's the best law you can have. Thank you. To me, what feels outdated um, to the GDPR, and I don't think the, the European lawmaker is to blame for it, but um, th there is this notion of technology neutrality in regulation. So w laws are not being drafted in a way that they refer to specific kinds of technology, but they rather state general goals of how things should be in terms of privacy, for example which in some sense is a good strategy because it doesn't require you to update the law every time you have a new technology. However, unfortunately the GDPR comes into life at a point in time where we're witnessing a fundamental paradigm shift where we're switching from this server-client model, from this um, kind of centralized model to a potentially more decentralized model where suddenly the categories of data controller, data processor, data subject are suddenly not that clear anymore. So we have a real problem of mapping the blockchain ontology onto the ontology of the uh, GDPR and that will create a lot of friction and potentially inhibit the growth and the, use, the usefulness of blockchain technology. So that, I think, is just unfortunate from a timing perspective. I don't think anything could have been done about it. So uh, at this point, I think it will be important for those governance mechanisms that have been built into the management of the GDPR through various national and supranational uh, officers and institutions and supervisory bodies to be able to um, uh, incorporate those changes into the living practice of GDPR. I think that will be of vital importance for, for blockchain to function under, under the GDPR framework. Obviously, we, we don't have any case law under it yet. The data protection authorities can fill it with life in this way or that way. And hopefully, they're following our live stream right now. Uh, let's see. Uh, Silvan, uh, your take on this. Right, so apart from the, from the blockchain area, I think IoT is an interesting thing to look at as well. If you look at the, the amounts of, of, of data that, that, that the smartwatch is collecting, for example, or, or perhaps even if you, if you look at your, your smart fridge that everyone will have in five years at home and it starts registering all the items that is taken out of it, um, and then, then suddenly the, the data that is being collected that may be probably not an, an anonymous, it's probably linked to your Amazon account because like every time you take out two beers that's being reordered from Amazon and then you, you get into situations where this data becomes more and more interesting for your health insurer as well. So I think, I think from, from this point of view it is, it is definitely becoming more challenging also like okay what, what is personal data, what is anonymized data, what the devices does, does it live on and then in, in, in spite of the, or like looking at the GDPR, like what is the controller and what is the processor of data and, and how do regulations and these kind of things apply to it. I think, I think we're getting into a very interesting area with, with, with all these things. Um, follow up question for all of you. I mean, uh, privacy is uh, uh, many c companies are of course, or businesses are interested in as well, but it's of course a privacy issue as well from the other end, let's, let's look at this from, from, from several angles here. Uh, one thing is, I mean, you were at BDI, that in a way is a, a lobbying organization for very, very big companies, I would, would say, or mostly huge companies. When I look at the GDPR, and I have myself worked at a startup, uh, these provisions all look very nice, and you would think, wow, that's probably pretty tricky to, to fulfill. Is there a bias in the current regulations for big players? who can afford the armies of lawyers and other consultants, and uh, will you, in a way, by default, as a small company, violate everyone's privacy anyhow, because you're just trying to get a, a company off the ground? Anybody has a take on that? I mean, as in hurdle to entry. It yeah. might even scare <coughs> off new actors, because they say, oh, 
we will be so violating uh, the GDPR, yeah. any privacy provisions. Yeah. Let's not do this. Uh, just the first thing, it's right, BDI is some kind of a lobby organization for German companies. Uh, they would say that they cover every kind of company. Of not course, how could ones, I have course, suggested otherwise? But uh, to be honest, of course, uh, only the big companies have enough people and resources to be involved in the BDI you know, work and stuff like that. Um, is it a law uh, that makes it difficult for small companies and that's easy for big ones? I think that's always uh, difficult, you know, um, when it comes to following regulation. It's always easier for big companies uh, to, to have uh, an own legal department and stuff like that, people that take care and they always uh, usually have more money. They can afford to have a lawyer advising them. If you have a two-person company, you don't want to spend that money, of course. I think there are in the GDPR there are a few elements, you know, uh, especially for for small and medium-sized companies. They don't have to report and document everything. I think uh, they don't necessarily have to have a DPO, a data protection officer. Um, I don't I don't know all the details, but I think there are a few elements. But uh, but the other question is, you know, if it is about protecting privacy and protecting personal data, uh, it cannot depend on the size of the company, right? It, it cannot be that you say every company that has more than 1,000 employees, uh, they have to, you know, have to, have to comply with that and all the other companies uh, that use our data, well, we don't care about that I that Imagine much. that in the auto industry, and Tesla would be allowed to build cars that in a way kill everyone because they're just still so small. Come on, yeah. how can they be because it costs money. standards of Mercedes-Benz, yeah. come on. That's in a way a fair argument to say if this is about protecting individual rights, then the size of the company might not matter, but it might still have the effect of keeping new actors out. Florian, your take, do you see this as an issue that I see it actually people. as an opportunity, right? So yeah. I, I, I apply my entrepreneurial spirit here and I would say that startups have the opportunity to actually differentiate themselves positively in the market through uh, incorporating privacy by design at a much more fundamental layer than a big corporation can uh, because a big company, it's like you know, a huge ship. For them to change course takes years. It's really difficult for them to implement uh, such fundamental changes like GDPR requires, whereas a startup, they are so nimble, uh, they can actually, you know, maybe create better products that are more privacy preserving or maybe allow users for the first time to monetize their data and kind of, you know, pivot new business models that we haven't actually seen in the market yet. So, uh, I, w I mean, uh, there might be bias in there, but I, I, I like to look at it more from, from the opportunity it provides as well to startups. Silva? Yeah, I can, I can only second that and, and, and highlight that like large corporations, they work with large data sets and sometimes they don't even know what data is stored where, on which systems and, and everything. And if you're building a startup from the ground up, you have the opportunity to design exactly what data is, is going to be stored where, how is it going to be stored, how is it going to be secured, etc. So from, from this point of view, I think, I think there are very fair chances for startups and young companies as well. Maybe <coughs> one thing to add, I think that lots of the startups that I, I know or partly used to work with, they just don't care that much about data protection because they have so many different things when they, they, they want to grow, right? So, um, you know, if, if, if you start your company, so you can't use Google Docs, right? Because if you don't have a, sp a special contract with them, you can't use MailChimp for your newsletters if you don't have a special contract with MailChimp uh, Corporation and, and all, all these things. And there are 500 uh, things that um, maybe I could tell you uh, that I saw. And I, I don't know, it's, it's not a good thing because usually if, if you take it seriously, data protection, uh, you should take care about all these things. But really a minority of, of startups does it. And it, not just startups, I think, right? I think it's, I, I read some, I read a study about it. I think even in Germany where they're in a way, I don't know if you can say they invented data protection here in, in Germany, but five up to 10% of the companies really uh, comply with data protection and the vast majority doesn't. I understand, thank you. Uh, one, Liz, how much more time do we have, Liz? Do we have another 15? Yeah, we're good. All right. Uh, one more follow-up question. Uh, 
Mm, we talked about about companies, startups, big ones uh, protecting uh, or in a way trying to protect uh, data uh, privacy or, or not. Uh, what about uh, the people, right? I mean, I, even I myself, I don't know who all has my, my personal data. Even if I'm not using Gmail, I might have friends who use Gmail, so Google still knows a lot about me. Uh, the GDPR, and I am a lawyer, strikes me as a bit complicated, so I wonder how would uh, someone who's not a lawyer or who has a different, we all have our lives to run, and we are not uh, professional privacy lawyers. With these laws and these technologies in place, are we in a way just doing an intellectual debate here about protecting privacy or not? Uh, most people just cannot protect their privacy by themselves because they have other things to do. They would either want a, a, an actual default option, I mean, not just some nice laws, the right to be forgotten, data protect, protect, portability, but uh, how should normal guys, normal people actually do this? I mean, they can't even know, right? So is, is, is the new law even going to help them? And what, are, I'm sorry, I'm just throwing this out here. Why don't you all have a take on that? So my take on that is also, again, entrepreneurial in the sense that I see an opportunity also for startups in the space that come, is, has come to be called legal tech, right, to provide services for consumers, pr natural persons, private individuals, to enforce their rights vis-a-vis -vis big companies, right? So there was this Austrian guy called Max Schrem who has sued Facebook successfully for the past couple of years. Um, he's an Austrian citizen, he sued them in Austria and then it went up to the ECJ and then back to the Austrian court and so on. And um, he did this on his own accord without a business model. He connected, uh, collected donations from people in order to finance his lawsuit and he tried to establish the concept of some kind of cl collective class action lawsuit in Europe, although that doesn't really exist but he was fighting for it. But what this guy did at some point will be turned into a startup, right? So you can, there, for example, there is this company called Flightright. They are a famous legal tech company. They basically allow you to um, get the, the to, to claim damages if your, if your airline um, is delayed by more than two hours. And that, that damage claim goes back to a European directive. And this European directive wa wasn't worth the paper it had been written on until the startup came and made it super easy for you um, to get that money from the airline. Basically, you just enter your flight number in an online form and click a button and then they sue the shit out of the airline until the money's there and they take a cut of 20-30%, right? And instead of getting nothing and having a hypothetical right, you get 70 to 80% of what you get by the law and you don't have to do anything. So the same services, I believe, will crop up with GDPR because there is so much money to be made, right? Um, so I, I think this is a huge actual opportunity for startups to, to get into the space and, and enforce the rights of consumers there. So, so actually, Max Rem, the, the guy that sued Facebook, he, he has now uh, set up uh, an organization called None of Your Business. And noyb.eu and he's raising funds it's a non-for-profit and and basically what his goal is is to um, is to sue companies for not complying to the GDPR and that is that is probably the point where it becomes interesting right so like unless someone is suing there's not much gonna happen to which my mom probably would say yes yeah, suing and litigation that's all nice see you in 10 years in the European Court of Justice I want privacy now go ahead I'm sorry I have nothing to add. I support that. Uh, you have individual rights uh, as a subject, as an individual, and as, as a person. You could, you have rights to information, and you could also, I could sue, you know, a company for mistreating uh, or not following data protection rules when they process my data. But to be honest, uh, it's even worse than with uh, with the flight, uh, the flight example. You know, to get your your money back. I think it's important to have some collective instruments um, and as said there are it's only a minority of companies uh, in, in Germany that really follow um, the rules and uh, I don't I don't I don't have that in mind anymore that the number but it was something like you need 30 days a year to read all the data protection declarations I think that you usually sign and click so 
it's just too much and you need, I think, really special organizations for that. I mean, you have data protection authorities in Germany, you, you have 17 of them and you can, you can always go to them and complain and maybe they act on behalf of you, but I think you need more than that. Uh, maybe a closing word. I think the whole GDPR is based on a fallacy, which is this idea that actually the government can save us from this huge privacy abuse that we see out there, and I don't believe that. So I think ultimately the market will have to sort this problem and society in general, and it will not be the government or enforcement agencies like uh, data protection agencies and so on that will effectively enforce privacy, but as a society we will have to find some kind of compromise between data sovereignty, data monetization, data privacy, and so on. And I, I don't. I don't know how that will work yet, but I think this is the only effective way of how we get somewhere. I don't, I don't really believe in GDPR being the solution to our problems. I think the solution will have to emerge organically rather from the bottom up than from this top down. This top down approach is this typical European way of going about things, but the internet just doesn't work that way. And uh, I've, yeah. The only problem that I see with that market-driven solution or, or you know, let, let, let the market in a way uh, solve that problem is a lot of people in the market, I don't know, they try to, of course, follow the Facebook and Google example, you know. Uh, that is what I experienced within the last years. Uh, in the beginning, 2012, you know, data wasn't really um, a, a big topic for, for the German industry, but uh, that really changed and... Um, I, in, in these four years that I, you know, worked with with the, with the industry people on the GDPR, I didn't I didn't I didn't meet so many people that were really, you know, uh, holding up privacy rights uh, as a fundamental right and saying we have to protect that. I didn't hear really these voices at all. I have to say, everybody, you know, was so surprised and astonished with companies like Facebook and Google acquiring so much money just with the use of of, of data in a way. Uh, and this is, I wouldn't say this is the big example for everybody now, but um, it is about exploiting data and using data and for most of the companies. It's not having privacy as a competition, you know, how do you say, um, you know, as a, as, um, yeah, as a competitive advantage. I, I, I rarely see successful companies. I only, maybe one example was Deutsche Telekom, I have to say, w within the last years. I think for two reasons, in a way, they are still state-owned, in a way. I think 30% of the telecom shares uh, belong to the, the, the federal government. So they have, you know, they're quite close to the state. And the thing is that they don't really have data business models. They earn their money with telecommunication and with cloud services. And I think they used to benefit from that Snowden revelations and with all the, you know, companies thinking that, oh, can we still use the cloud, IBM, Amazon? Uh, uh, Microsoft, and they, you know, they were trying to get into that and saying, hey, we do German privacy, you can come to us and everything's fine, but only example. Thank you very much. I, I think we are not running out of time, but we're running low on time, let's put it like that. Uh, if each of you could maybe tell me one thing concerning privacy, data protection that you're either working on, improving, or dealing with, uh, just so that we have some example. If you can tell, I mean, of course, if you have a confidentiality agreement in place, don't tell me. <laughs> uh, don't, is this live? We're live, right? Okay, okay, so please don't. Uh, go ahead. Right, so what I'm doing right now is um, setting up a, 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 a company called Tech GDPR, where we, where we help tech companies become compliant to the, to the GDPR. And like, like, why, why would people use that and not, and not like, the, like, like, like your lawyer's offices? Basically, because we have an understanding of things like IoT and blockchain. And if you work in this kind of technology, you don't want to be explaining your your lawyer for for two days like how blockchain technology works. So, so that is basically what we do uh, in order to help companies become compliant. Um. The only thing that I'm doing right now is, for example, when it comes to, to data protection, I, I give lectures at university for students that want to become state employees, you know, they yeah, want to work for the state later on, and I try to explain them why it is important yeah, within their job. Awareness. Okay, good. 
So, yeah, as I said in the very beginning, uh, I have to explain to German politicians what the privacy implications are of blockchain technology and related decentralized technologies. And so I would like the blockchain community that is present to come forward with ideas of how, um, of what I could tell the politicians of how, <laughs> how, how we're going to solve those issues. Um, with privacy and blockchain. I think that is very much needed at this point. Thank you very much. I think we're running into the closing uh, statements now. I'm going to ask each of you in a way to tell me if you had a wish. I don't know if you believe in wishes. Don't wish another wish. But if you want to change, or two wishes, that, no. But if you want to change one thing, be it the laws or actual, I mean, factual data protection, privacy, anything that comes to your mind, please name it. I, for my one thing, I wouldn't want to live in a world where I have to ask, Alexa, Siri, is my privacy protected? And then I get the answer, yes. Uh, maybe that's not what we want. Uh, and then please, uh, your closing remarks in that regard. What would you like to change, if you could change it, or if it could be changed? I think, I think for me, the thing is, is mostly about awareness. What's what Florian said before, this is, this is probably not something that's really going to make a big impact top down, but it has to be bottom up. So if people become more aware of, of the impact of posting all your data, online on social media and, and giving, giving Apple, Google, who knows what, access to everything that happens on your phone in your life. I think, I think it's time that people um, become more aware of that and more conscious of what they're sharing and, and uh, doing to their future potentially. I rarely know any other legal area where there is such a big gap between um, the theory in the books and w how it looks like in, in, in real world. Maybe tax law, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not even tax law probably, I don't know. But uh, so I would wish we find instruments to reduce that gap. Thank you. Uh, I guess I would like to see a large scale implementation of an alternative business model to Facebook's advertising driven model. I would like to see somebody build that and actually execute it to a point where it has some actual scale, right? Because I'm sick of just talking about this hypothetical stuff, how blockchain is going to save the world. I would really like to just not see somebody, you know, building it and just, you know, so because we need, if you want to, if you want something different than Facebook, we get, somebody has to build it, right? We need to go from theory to practice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we're opening up to the audience now, if anybody has questions. I mean, Liz, could you also be on the lookout? Anybody has questions for anyone? Please go ahead and ask them. Why don't you? I have a history in the IT industry for a couple of years, as you may, may see. I'm a little bit older there, and I've worked in the cloud industry. And what I find interesting about all this privacy discussion is that actually people are not too much concerned about making a big distinction between what is mandatory information and what is voluntary information. We talk about the election, the Facebook, whatever. This is part of the things that you give to whoever will have possession of your data. I'm, in my age, more concerned about the data that I have to provide mandatory to government authorities, to insurance companies and health insurance companies. And I wonder how you see this conflict developing and how you know, the new law may be uh, helping with that element too. Well, my answer would be that there is a very important principle in data protection law. It's the principle of data minimization. Uh, as a data uh, a controller, you're only allowed to ask for the data that you really need stop and not more of that. If, 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 if they ask more of your data, for example, if you, if, you, if you want to buy shoes at Amazon, they need your shoe size, of course, you, you, you know, but they don't probably need, I don't know, what information about your, which glasses you wear. So if they ask that mandatorily, they, it's a breach of, of data protection rules. And um, then again, what I say, we need better enforcement probably. But th it is already in the laws, what you, what you say. Thank you. Um, hi. So I wanted to like, yeah, ask a follow-up to like something that Florian said about that we, yeah, need to to wait for corporations to save us, which I very very much disagree with, um, because I think corporations got on, got in, got us into this mess that we are already in right now, and I think for just waiting for someone to know, 
build the, the super cool uh, privacy where social network that we can all live in and, and don't have to fear like um, our data being exploited. We first have to make sure that data protection laws like the GDPR um, are actually making the digital lives of everybody better, more secure and safer so that we can enable people who don't have access to technology right now actually have the chance to grow and learn and then maybe do something for the future which I don't like, this might be very theoretical, but I think the question I want to say or ask is, in like maybe all three of you, in your daily work, do you think about how you can make the work that you do be accessible and yeah, to all the people so that you do good for the people and not just like for the corporations, for the startups, for the big and small companies, but just like for every person who sits here in the room with children, with parents, with friends who don't know anything about it, so that yeah, we can have a better life and something like this, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, so it, the reason why I said that corporations need to say, I don't think I said that in verbatim, but I, I mean, I do think that, I mean, Facebook has gotten so big as it did because it's just super successful, right? And Facebook, they're, I think they are subsidizing internet access in developing countries. Uh, basically, you get free internet access to Facebook and Wikipedia and stuff like that. So they're very smart about their rollout strategy uh, worldwide. And I, I don't see an alternative to just another company coming up being more successful than Facebook and at the same time being either more privacy preserving or being at least better in, put in kind of sharing its revenue with its users, right? So I, I, I think we some, something in the model needs to change. And maybe it's not the privacy that is going to improve, but maybe you're at least going to participate in all that money and value that is being currently accrued on the level of Facebook, the company, and maybe that needs to <laughs> trickle down in a sense <laughs> onto into you know the network of of the users right but so Florian, maybe at least that needs to change is that likely is it more likely that WeChat will take over and we will all have our live ID on WeChat and if I share a posting by you my social index gets lower and I don't get a loan I mean it's more if 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 is it likely that Facebook will be uh, outflanked by a better company that's not so evil or rather even be replaced by something even worse uh, I, I mean, Sorry, so profit, right now what I get from Facebook is the ability to connect with people worldwide and exchange information and so on, and everything is free to me as a user. However, I pay with it with my data, right, and with my attention, my eyeballs, and so on. And if there is, if there would be something that is from functionality-wise just as frictionless and beautiful and nice and everything just like Facebook, but at the same time, I at least earn some money, I get some share in the revenue that this entity generates, I guess people would be willing to switch. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, right, right now we have some form of market failure. There is no competition to Facebook, so even if I wanted to switch, I couldn't, right? It's network effects and so on. So um, network effects drive market failures in a sense. So I think we need something that is as good as Facebook and at the same time either more privacy preserving or better in terms of sharing the revenues. That's, that's the way I see it, I don't know. You too, you want to have a, maybe a sentence to this and no, then we come no to the sentence next for question? Me. I'm yeah. fine. Yeah, no, good, well then. So uh, I've seen a couple of blockchain technologies using this, right? You have this one where it like monitors your phone as you walk into a retail slot, right? And then it, you know, sends you a text message and says, "Hey, you know, you just walked into, you know, Verizon. Would you like to buy a, you know, would you like to get free tokens for sharing your data, right?" And then it shares it across the network with the other retailers, right? Then you have this other one that, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about names, but you have this other one that, you know, pays you for opening emails, right? It, is that any better though, right? I mean, we're already in the situation where we're getting free Facebook, right? We're getting free Google, right? Is is tokenizing these you know microtransactions where we might pay for one additional blog post a day or something? Is that worth it? Is that worth our privacy? I mean, how is that better? And it, are there any al alternatives? 
did I get you right that you say is it better than is it better to have a privacy friendly service but you have to pay for that? Okay, what what you said that Facebook gives back a bit of money to the users. Yeah, you have to explain. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's a start. I mean, um, it, it's all about incentives, right? So right now, the incentive of Facebook is really to exploit your personal data as much as possible because that drives their revenue. And if you have a different network where you are the sovereign owner of your data and you monetize it through microtransactions in the network, then there is no incentive to exploit you. There is an incentive to make you an active member of that network and have you share your data and sell it off. I mean, I don't say that this world, I don't know if this is a good world to live in, honestly, I have no idea, but it's at least an alternative model that seems viable to me. Um, yeah, and some I, of you wish I, to try. I mean, you might have a point, there was this project Diaspora, I think, right, which was like an open source Facebook, which did not monetize these data, and I don't know where that has left off, uh, but I think that's not being, it, it failed in a way. It was like an open source Facebook mm -hmm. without these micropayments and it, it couldn't scale uh, or didn't give such a nice experience. So you might have a point that for better or worse, if you then still have the monetary incentive, then you might get a better thing. I don't know, and I don't know if Facebook pays you, but. <laughs> Yeah, I think maybe the better idea is not, um, you know, getting paid by Facebook. Be you know, they can exploit data. We get paid a bit for that because how much would there be for euro a year? I mean, who, who probably needs that? 14, right? Better idea would probably be to have the option either I use Facebook for free and they can exploit data or I pay for that and then they don't exploit it. Or and I spend it, uh, I give it as, a, to, as to charity. Right? No, I, I pay for Facebook. I pay. I pay, oh. I don't know, 20 euro right. a year, for so example. Maybe I don't want the four euros they pay me, and I just say give it to my favorite charity. All right. But th let's move on. We have one more question. We're really low on time. We have so many more questions. But Thanks. Oh. My question is, why should a corporation or an individual put um, a proof or a track of his misbehavior in terms of data privacy on a blockchain, on a world computer, on a singleton, state machine forever uh, in in front of all those unknown unknowns like German Abmann, Anwälte, or or all those financial risks arising from this law. Why, why should one use uh, Ethereum as a track record for his misbehavior? Th there are a lot of incentives to use Ethereum or any other kind of blockchain network for various reasons, right? It's a huge access to financial markets, uh, access to yeah, value networks of various kinds. So there is a big incentive to use it. The problem is h how do you exploit that opportunity while at the same time not violating uh, privacy laws? And um, I think that's, that's the trade-off here. Uh. Thank you very much. Who could have one more sentence, and then uh, we need to we need to stop. And if any further questions, please ask them them after th this. Uh, I'm very sorry, but otherwise we would be running over and screwing everything up afterwards. So, all right, uh, to to well, I don't need a sentence. You can have two. <laughs> um, no, I think I, I I definitely agree with with, with Florian. There there are different reasons to do that, and uh, it it also you also participate in in like a more open system and a more open market. And of course, your data can be led back to you by combining information from exchanges, from wallets, from, from whatever you're using. Um, but it's it, like you have more control. You're in control of, of what's happening there. All right. Thank you very much. I hope that answered it. Or if not, then I hope that we have further discussions uh, after this. Thank you very much for the, to the panelists for participating. <laughs> Thank you very much, Liz.